Welcome to St Peter's Online. Uh, my name's Rod Chiswell and it's great to have you with us today. It's been wonderful to return to physical church gatherings over the last three weeks to the St Peter's site for Sunday at 8.30 and 6 and the Carinia School site for Sunday at 10 and 4. About two-thirds of our congregations have regathered for the restart of church, which means there's still a considerable number of you accessing our St Peter's online and radio content each Sunday. So to that end, end over the past three weeks, we've been live streaming our Sunday at 10 gathering from Carinia. Now, occasional technical difficulties have meant mixed success for the online and radio delivery, particularly with sound, and we're sorry for that. But for this reason, earlier this week, we made the decision to produce a pre-recorded cut-down version of the service for those of you who can't get to church uh, due to illness or vulnerability or shift work. While online and radio content is not church in the biblical sense of the word, since it doesn't involve gathering, my hope and prayer is that it will still provide solid encouragement from God's word to you and your families until such a time as you're able to return to enjoy church with us in person again. So with all that said, let's begin our time by praising God with one of my favourite hymns, How Great Thou Art.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you we can praise your name and sing of your greatness today. Thank you that you are the creator and sustainer of this world and that you've shown us your deep love for one, each one of us by sending your one and only son to die on the cross to deal with our sin. Thank you that through faith in him we can be your people and praise and worship you today. So strengthen us by your spirit as we hear from your word that we might be encouraged to honour you this week in every part of life. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the last few weeks, uh, we've been looking at the book of Judges, which reminds us that God remains faithful even when his people do not. So today we come to the next in exciting instalment, and I thought it might be good to get a sneak peek with our kids segment for today. Let's watch and enjoy. Deborah and Barak's duet, Judges 4 and 5. The people of Israel were ignoring God's commands. Because Israel was worshiping idols, God had allowed the Canaanites to rule over them. A Canaanite general named Sisera terrorized Israel for 20 years. The Israelites were defenseless against Sisera, who commanded 900 iron chariots. Realizing they were helpless, the Israelites finally cried out to God for help. Deborah was Israel's judge at that time. She often sat under a palm tree near her home, and there the people came to her to settle their arguments. One day, she sent for a military leader named Barak. When he came, she asked him a question. Hasn't God already told you what to do, she asked. Gather 10,000 soldiers and prepare for battle. God has promised to bring Sisera, his army, and his iron chariots to the Kishon River. There, God will give you the victory. Barak was fearful and answered, Are you going to come too? Because I won't go unless you agree to come with me. Yes, I'll go with you, Deborah agreed. But understand that you will not get the credit for killing Sisera. Instead, God will give the honor of taking Sisera's life to a woman. Barak gathered his 10,000 troops and went up Mount Tabor. When Sisera heard that Barak was gathering men to fight, Sisera moved his army and all 900 iron chariots near the Kishon River, just as God had said. Deborah announced to Barak, Go now. The Lord has given Sisera into your hand today. Has not God already gone out before you to help you? Barak and his men charged down from Mount Tabor, and as the Israelites advanced, God confused Sisera's army. God sent a powerful rainstorm that soaked the ground and caused the river to flood. Sisera's chariots sank deep into the mud. They were stuck and completely useless. Sisera's men tried to run from the Israelites, but the Israelites caught them and killed them. The flooded river carried other soldiers away. Every single one of Sisera's men died that day. Meanwhile, Sisera had jumped out of his chariot to run for his life. Sisera knew that the Canaanites were at peace with a man named Heber. Sisera headed straight for Heber's tents. Heber's wife, Jael, saw Sisera rushing toward the tents. Come inside my tent, Jael invited. Don't be afraid. Jael was being nice to Sisera, but she really considered him her enemy. Sisera hurried into the tent and Jael covered him with a blanket and gave him some milk to drink. Sisera said, stand in the doorway of the tent, and if someone asks you if any man is in here, tell him no. Sisera was so worn out that he quickly fell asleep. Jael quietly moved over to him and killed him with a hammer and a tent peg before he had a chance to wake up. Then Jael waited outside the tent for Barak. Come with me, Jael called to Barak, and I will show you the man you're looking for. Barak followed her into the tent. To his surprise, he saw Sisera lying dead on the tent floor. The honor for killing Sisera went to a woman, just as God had promised. Later, Deborah wrote a song about Israel's victory over Sisera and the Canaanites. She and Barak sang about God's greatness in the battle. God had rescued the people of Israel yet again. Nothing, not even 900 iron chariots, could stop God from keeping his promise to rescue the Israelites. God gave Israel peace for the next 40 years, but eventually Israel turned away from God again. God allowed another nation to trouble the Israelites. Again, the Israelites cried out for help, and God sent another judge to rescue them. This became a pattern for Israel. Disobedience, crying out for God's help, victory, peace, over and over again. 
Israel's judges could help the Israelites fight against their enemies, but the judges couldn't save them from their real problem, sin. Hundreds of years later, God would send Jesus, his son, to die on the cross. God saves us from the punishment of our sins when we put our faith in Jesus' death as the payment for our sins. This gives us victory forever. Well, in a while, we're going to hear that story read from God's word and Xavier's going to unpack it for us. But before we get to that, let's have some announcements by way of a short video uh, which seeks to give you an update of the state of play with regard to matters that affect our church family in this COVID-19 season. I recorded this one earlier this week. Hi, everyone. Uh, once again, we've much to be thankful for as a church family here at St Peter's. Last Sunday saw nearly 300 people come together to worship God, hear from his word and spur one another on to love and good deeds. Uh, thank you all for being prepared to wear face masks, as has been strongly encouraged by our State Premier Gladys Berejiklian. Xavier said to the Sunday at 8.30 congregation that they looked like a pack of bandits, but I actually thought they looked pretty classy uh, due to all the ladies who'd been busy making uh, material hand, uh, face masks. Now, I realise they'll take some getting used to, but regardless of how they look or feel, it's such a simple way for us to show Christ-like love to one another in this COVID-19 season. So once again, next weekend, when you come to church, uh, please wear your face mask if you have one. Uh, if not, we'll provide one for you at the entrance. In other good news, I'm pleased to announce that the block next door to Auntie Lucy's, where we hold our Wednesday Colbar Front Yard Church, came up for sale recently and it looks like we'll be able to purchase it with some money that's been given by a handful of generous donors. Uh, we've been looking to secure a block in Coldale for the past few months to uh, kind of assure the long-term future of the Coldale Front Yard Church and allow for some further development of that outreach opportunity amongst Aboriginal people in our parish. So this comes as a great answer to prayer. Uh, more money needs to be raised to clear that block and to get it ready for a simple structure to provide an all-weather outdoor gathering place. Uh, plans will soon be drawn up, but having the block provides the possibility of return to that church gathering for up to 100 people, possibly as early as fourth term, uh, COVID-19 restrictions permitting. If you'd like to make a contribution to the clearing of the block, we're now looking for a further $33,000 to do so. So just contact Amanda at the St Peter's Church office uh, if you'd like details on how to give to that project. So many other good things have happened over the past year at St Peter's as I reflect on it, despite the difficulties involved due to the coronavirus pandemic. If you'd like to hear what those things are and celebrate some of them uh, and the things that have happened in the life of our St Peter's Church family over the past year, a really good way to do it is to come along to the annual general meeting That'll be held on uh, Monday the 31st of August at 7pm at the uh, St Peter's Chapel. Reports for that gathering will be sent out by email this coming Friday and paper copies will also be available from the parish office. Nomination forms and job descriptions for parish councillor and parish warden positions are also av available upon request from the church office. Now we need to select uh, six parish councillors and two wardens at the AGM and nominations must be in by Monday the 24th of August, along with a photo and 200 words to help people get to know who you are if possible. You can pre-register to physically attend by calling the parish office or simply by keeping an eye on your emails for the link to register online. Uh, that email will also contain a Zoom link for those who'd like to attend and vote by Zoom and I trust that that will be helpful to some as well. Now finally, I want to commend uh, the new book uh, chosen this term by the St Peter's Book Club for reading and discussion. It's called uh, Respectable Sins and it's written by Jerry Bridges. Uh, this book encourages us to address the sins in our lives that we tend to ignore, like jealousy, or anger, judgmentalism, selfishness and pride. Now in all these areas and more, uh, Jerry Bridges encourages us to repent and find hope 
in the profound mercy of the gospel and the transforming grace of God. Now, at the very reasonable price of $25, these books will go like hotcakes. So make sure you get yours from the parish office as soon as you can. Well, that's the state of play for this week at St. Peter's. Thanks for your ongoing partnership in the gospel. May God protect and strengthen you and your loved ones in the week ahead. And remember, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. See you soon. Well, I hope that puts you in the picture on the state of play. Uh, while many things are changing in our world at the moment, God's word remains unchanged. And before we hear it read now by uh, Jacob and uh, Xavier preachers, let's just bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you that you speak to us in your word. Uh, please strengthen us now by your spirit to listen well that we might understand and apply what we learn to our daily lives for your glory. Amen. Today's Bible reading comes from Judges chapter 4. Again the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Herosheth Hagoyim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She went to Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, if you don't go with me I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There, Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Habab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harasheth Hagayim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord rooted Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Herosheth Hagayim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, Is anyone in there? Say, No. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the tent peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with a tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. This is the end of the reading.
I used to do all sorts of things with my brother-in-law in my early 20s, surfing, uh, windsurfing, kayaking, you name it, and we'd always be super hungry after activity like that. And if we'd just finished a windsurfing session at Long Reef, he'd buy me six Macca's hamburgers, or if we'd just trained in Sydney Harbour for a kayak race, he'd do the same, another six hamburgers. And the thing is, he never expected anything in return. He had a bit more cash than I did. He just simply shared, shared generous, generously, and 30 years on, I haven't forgotten it. Well, today we continue in our reading of the book of Judges and we come to consider God's victory and how he shares that with us. Uh, He shares. And so that is the theme of God's sharing and God's victory is going to crop up as we go through chapter 4 and 5. So how do you uh, share in God's victory? What might that mean for you? And are you actually sharing in it? Uh, Those are some of the questions I'll put to you in the second half of this talk. Now, the structure of our message this morning is very simple. There's a victory followed by a victory song. And I'm going to recount the victory first, and then I'm going to show how the song uh, helps us to apply things uh, to our lives. So, the events, the victory first of all. We're up the the north of Israel. We'll zoom in the situation. Well, after the death of Ehud, the judge, God's people did evil again in his sight. As a result, we have another revolution of that cycle that we've seen already before. So God sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Hazor. Uh, Jabin's living up here in the north. He's the enemy. And Jabin was in an alliance with Sisera. And Sisera is probably based down here in the southwest in Harasheth, Hagoim. And Sisera was basically Jabin's enforcer. Sisera had a professional army with the latest technology at the time, iron. Uh, This was the late Bronze Age, and this was new. He had iron, iron chariots, 900 of them. And so Jabin, with Sisera's help, had the power to oppress God's people, and that's what he did for 20 years. Now, they would have probably imposed their gods, taken the land they wanted, extorted God's people from their wealth, and took and even raped their women. Uh, It was a fearful time. You would have stayed off the main roads, skirted around the small tracks to avoid Sisera, and his men. And it seemed helpless. It could have, would have been like Australia, a non-nuclear nation, trying to defend itself against a nuclear power. However, God in his mercy is going to deliver, give victory to his people. Now, there are three main plays in this extraordinary deliverance. Um, there is Deborah, a prophetess. There is Barak with his volunteer farmer militia. And there's Jael, a tent-dwelling woman who's not part of God's people. What happens? Well, we start with Deborah, a remarkable woman. She's a prophetess. In other words, God was speaking through her. Uh, She probably gave guidance to the tribes of Israel, sought to heal the fractures that were appearing in the nation because of the oppression in these extraordinary times. And God speaks to Deborah and tells her to summon Barak, which she does. So enter Barak. What do we know about Barak? Well, his his name means lightning. Um, He's living up here in the north. And he's probably already a respected local leader. He may have had some fighting experience in some local skirmishes. Yet God is calling him, through Deborah, to step up at a national level. Why? Well, because God is going to give victory to his people through Barak. Uh, The time has come to stop hiding. The time has come to step up and confront the problem. And so God says to Barak, through Deborah, go. Take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulon, the two tribes about where he was living, and lead them up Mount Tabor. And I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and I will give him into your hands. So God, the commander-in-chief, here gives orders to Barak. God promises Barak victory and even gives him a strategy and a battle plan into the bargain. Now, This would have seemed like mission impossible for Barak, you know, going into the jaws of death, foot soldiers against tanks. And Barak hesitates um, in his faith, in trusting in God. He says, I'm not going to step up unless you, Deborah, come along. Well, she agrees, but says, you know, the honour will not be yours, Barak, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. Now, the outcome is sure. And we're thinking Deborah is going to get the glory. Uh, She's the woman here, but that's not what happens. So all this sets us up for the battle. But before we get to the battle and to Jael, uh, the third player in all this, 
uh, we have a little side point that is really important. Uh, we are told in verse 11, have a look at that in your Bibles, chapter 4, verse 11, that Heber, a Kenite, from a people group related to Moses, but not part of the Israelites, Heber has moved his tent north. In other words, Heber, rather than allying himself with God's people through his ties to Moses, he's taken his chances and allied himself to God's enemies through Jabin. Little detail here, lock it in, but important. So let's get to the battle uh, before we get to Jael. So Barak moves his men, uh, these farmers who are willing to fight, to Mount Tabor. Uh, Sisera gets the intel, gets informed. He moves his professional army to the Kishon River, to the river flats below the mountain. And when the time is right, God gives the command through Deborah to go. And it's all on. <laughs> Barak's farm and militia run down the mountain into the jaws of death, risking their lives. They engage Sisera's trains force on the flatlands. And surprisingly, miracle of all miracles, <laughs> Barak's men get the upper hand. Now, we're not told how, yet they chase Sisera's men, cutting them down all the way back to Sisera's base. Now, we'll come back to see why this happens in a moment. But this is a great victory. Uh, and Sisera, seeing that the battle isn't going his way, hops off his chariot, he runs off to the northeast in the other direction to find refuge. Where? With Heba. Remember, Heba's on friendly terms with Jabin? And this is where Jael, Heba's wife, comes in. Now, Sisera's exhausted. He's been running for his life. He comes to Jael's tent, a supposed ally. Let's read what happens. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, <laughs> come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. And she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him up. Milk, that's interesting. It makes you go to sleep, doesn't it? Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes comes by and asks you, where is, is there anyone in here? Say, no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer, went to him quietly while he lay asleep, exhausted, and she drove the tent peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. <laughs> wow. And just then, Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera, and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her, and there lay Sisera, with a tent peg through his temple, dead. <laughs> Extraordinary. Jael is the woman who took the biggest prize, Sisera, as God said through Deborah. Now, apparently, nomadic women of that time were responsible, actually, for putting up the tent, so Jael would have been pretty handy with a mallet and a peg. Uh, it struck me, actually, as the husband of Jael, You'd feel a little bit nervous at night sleeping with a wife like that, especially if you had a fight, wouldn't you? Or a row, you'd go, are we okay, dear? <laughs> well, there you go. So God, through Deborah, through Barak and his volunteer fighting farmers and through Jael, a foreigner, God gives his people a miraculous victory, extraordinary victory. And once Jabin's strength is gone, uh, he's brought to an end and the oppression of 20 years is removed. So God, as commander-in-chief, won this victory for his people. Quite a story. Now, what are we to do with this? Well, here's the question I've been grappling with, and, and I'll put it to you, uh, because it brings us to one of the major themes that relates to you and to me as well. So, who is the judge or the deliverer in this cycle? Is it Deborah? Barak? Jael? Now, you think maybe it's Deborah, but when you look in Hebrews chapter 11, for instance, that great list of those who trusted in God, it's Barak who's up there with Samson and Jephthah and the judges who put foreign armies to flight. Who, who is the deliverer? I mean, we're told that Deborah's judging, but of all the accounts we've seen so far, it's been individuals like Othniel, Ehud and Shamgar, but this one comes out clearly portrayed as a shared deliverance. And you see this in the victory song that follows. Uh, we didn't read it. Have a read of it later if you get some time. It's sometimes called Deborah's Song, but it's not. Have a look at verse 1 of chapter 5 if you've got your Bibles there. Is it Deborah's? No, it's Deborah's and Barak's song. In fact, when you read through the song, it's Deborah and Barak's. It's the village people's song, not the band of village people, you know, <laughs> the villagers, I mean. And Jael is even in there. 
This is a shared victory. God's victory, yes, but shared. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about sharing, you know, the, the concept of sharing. Um, we encourage our children to share. I hope you do. Uh, we long for a world where the resources are shared equally. Uh, when I consider my dog, for instance, I notice he'll share his mat, he'll share his water bowl, he'll share his toy, <laughs> even with a cat, but he'll never share his food. Should people be like that? Dog eat dog world? With well, we say no. Why is sharing for us as human beings such an important attribute? Well, I believe it's because it's part of God's character to share. God the Father shares with his Son, and this overflows to us who are made in his image. We share because God is a God who shares. So let's come back to this shared victory and draw out a few lessons about sharing in God's victory from this song. Firstly, this was clearly all God's victory uh, that God's people shared in. You see, I don't know if you wondered, how in the world did Barak defeat Sisera's professional army? How did he do that with just a bunch of willing farmers? Well, the victory song tells us how. You see, as Barak was rallying his troops, organising them on Mount Tabor, God was rallying his troops, if you like, organising them down in the Jordan Valley to the south. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a little cloud that started in the south. You can see this in verse 4 of the song. And God gathered millions of droplets of water, like a huge army of little soldiers growing in strength. And as the cloud progressed upwards north in the valley, it became stronger and stronger into a massive storm cell that came over the area of Mount Tabor. And as the call for Barak's men to run down the mountain came, God unleashed his army of water, which ran down the hills ahead of them, filling every gully, turning streams into water-roaring torrents, flooding the plain below. And Sisera's chariots became bogged, and his advantage was gone, and God handed victory to Barak, the man whose name is called Lightning. This was God's victory. God's army went ahead. And so Barak and his men basically shared in God's victory over the enemy. Now, when you come to the New Testament, there is a parallel here for you as a Christian. Now, you share, really, if you've trusted in Christ, you share really in God's victory for you in Christ. Jesus is the one who has triumphed over sin for you. Uh, he is the one who is victor victorious over death for you. Uh, he is the one who has defeated the power of the evil one for you. <laughs> and unlike Barak, there was no fighting to be done on your part. It is all done for you. And so when it comes to being saved or delivered by God from his judgment, we are, we are more like the people of the villages who watched on as Barak's troops did the job. And it's like that. Being saved from our sin, we simply need to trust in Christ and his victory on our behalf. And that's why our song at the end of time, and you can see this in Revelation chapter 7, is we will sing salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. It's not our works or good works. It's not our faith that wavers. It was what God has done for us. Victory belongs to our God. And so we trust in what he's done in Christ. I wonder if you've done that. The second thing about sharing in this victory is about caring for God's people. Sharing by caring for God's people. And we see this with Jael. Now, you might wonder about the morality of Jael. You might feel a little bit uncomfortable about proclaiming her virtues like the song does. <laughs> From the perspective of God, God's enemies, she was a lying murderer and a clever opportunist who threw in her lot with the winning side. Yet from the perspective of God and his people, she was the one who participated in removing, defeating the great oppressor, the great enemy. Ever wonder why she did this? I mean, you say, well, it's God's plan, yes. But what was going on in her mind? Was it just mere opportunism or did she disagree with her husband's alliance now with Jabin was she angry about that or as as a woman did she witness Sisera's methods taking women as sex slaves and abusing them and raping them did she fear for herself we don't know what we do know is this God said to Abraham and to his descendants his people afterwards I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. Jael blessed God's people. So in this song, she is called blessed, most blessed of ten dwelling women. 
Did you know, there is a similar theme in the New Testament for you as a Christian. Jesus said, whatever you did to the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, these disciples of mine, when they were in need, you did it to me. To take an interest in someone, to care for them, to visit them, support them, simply because they are a disciple of Christ, is to align yourself with Christ himself to share in Christ and his priorities. And you know, to ignore God's people and not to take an interest in them, to not meet up with them, to love them if you can, it's, it's to not share in Christ, it's not to love Christ himself. And JL shared in taking an interest in God's people, I wonder whether you share the same interest God has. And thirdly, uh, this song rejoices in how God's people participated in his victory. They shared by participating. Uh, they shared by stepping up. Now, sure, this was God's victory, but many, men in particular, took their responsibility, stepped up even in the face of danger. And Deborah and Barak sing about this. They sing, when the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. And so the song rejoices when God's people step up in his purposes willingly. But you know, this song isn't all joy. There's also kind of lament, sadness. You see, there were some from certain tribes in God's people who should have stepped up, but they didn't. Reuben, tribe in Israel, stayed with the flocks. Gilead stayed by the Jordan River well, for whatever reason. Dan stayed with his ships by the coast. They had other priorities, other things to do. They, they should have stepped up at this time and shared in what God was doing, but they didn't. And I reckon they would have found this song pretty hard to sing. There was no joy of victory for them. You know, I think it's marvellous when God's people step up, either in Christ's mission or caring for Christ's church. And I think, you know, you as a Christian, you should support, pray for and encourage those who do. Uh, we should support our growth group leaders. Um, we should encourage our children's ministry workers we should take an interest in those doing scripture. We should give to the cold hour work. We should uphold those who go overseas. We should even step up ourselves if we can. You know, if you go for complacency, comfort and convenience and say, oh, I just couldn't be bothered, you risk actually to become an armchair critic. And unfortunately in church life, there can be armchair critics, you know, spectators who come, who have a lot of negative things to say, but who don't stand up themselves to be involved in Christ's purpose and his victory. And there's, there's no joy in that, just shame. So if you've been challenged today, perhaps the Lord is speaking to you to say, you need to step up, maybe in family life, as a dad or in church life. Uh, let us know. <laughs> It'd be great joy for us. Let us know on the feedback number. We'd love to chat with you about that and how you might get involved in God's purposes in Christ. Well, today we've been thinking about God's victory, how God shares his victory with us. Um, the prime way we share in Christ's victory is simply to by trusting in Christ and what he has done for us, that he's gone before us. Second, we've seen we can share by caring for the disciples of Jesus, especially those who are in need. And the third way we've seen is by stepping up and getting involved. You know, many in that time, in the book of Judges and God's people, did that. Now, there's not much to sing about in the book of Judges, but this was one occasion where there was joy and a song. So, are you sharing in Christ's victory, caring for his people, being involved in his purposes somehow? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the victory that you have won for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. For he has gone ahead of us and he's been victorious over sin for us, paying for the penalty that we deserve. He's been victorious over death and you raised him from the dead for our sake. And he's been victorious over the evil one who accuses us. Satan no longer has a leg to stand on. We thank you, Father, for the victory you have won and we pray that you would help us to trust you and to share in that by faith. And we pray, therefore, also, Lord, that we would share in your victory by caring for your people, your disciples, especially if there's need, and also by stepping up ourselves in Christ's mission and his purposes for his church. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.
Well, thanks, Dave. What a marvellous thing it is that we can share in Christ's victory simply through trusting in him. Let's respond to God's word now by singing a song that encourages us to continue to find our refuge in God and his amazing grace to us in the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you've given us the victory over sin and death through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you that through your amazing grace in him, you have saved us and made us useful in your service. So please strengthen us by your Spirit to keep trusting Jesus, our Deliverer, and to step up that we might play our part in your mission to introduce people to Jesus and help them home to heaven. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of our time together. Uh, Thank you for joining us for St Peter's Online or on 89.7 Rima FM. Uh, Online viewers, if you have feedback for us today, just point your phone camera at the QR code that will come up on the screen now. Uh, If you then click on the link that appears, it should take you to our St Peter's Connect card where you can give us your feedback. Uh, If it is your first time with us at St Peter's Online, it would be great if you could let us know who you are so that we can help you get better connected with our church family. Uh, For those who prefer to text or call us and leave a message, you can also do that now on our feedback number, which is on the screen now. For our radio listeners, that number is 0466 200 791. 
That's 0466 200 791. Well, I hope you have a great week and I look forward to maybe seeing you next Sunday at one of our gatherings, uh, Sunday at 8.30 or Sunday at 6 at the St Peter's site or Sunday at 10 and Sunday at 4 at the Corinna School site. But for those who are still unable to get to church in this uncertain season, I look forward to you joining us again online or by radio on Rima FM. We'll see you then. Mm-hmm.